Uh, we'll be here from, uh, from 11 o'clock to 11.30. So if, if you have questions about reimbursement, about, uh, about registration, about the meaning of life, or things of that sort, <laughs> then, uh, then you can see her. Uh, and that'll be, that will be your last opportunity to actually figure out the meaning of life. So, um, so uh, please don't miss that. Um, and then um, there's a little bit of a change to the schedule. So on the last day for the student presentation, the students of Marson and Batidia will be will be interchanged. I mean, not, not the students will be interchanged, but I, but I think the times for the presentations will be interchanged. That is, the students of Marson will follow all of Marson, and the students of Batidia will be right after lunch when the Marson students were going to be. Uh, so, students, I mean, those of you who are here and those of you who are not here, please take heed of that. Uh, and, um, oh, okay, so I think that's all the announcements, but it just remains for the next speaker to actually be here. That's not, uh, I, can try and tell, I can try and tell some more jokes, but I think maybe that would not be uh, right. so, uh, our, our next speaker, who will make a grand entrance, Our next speaker, the greatest living, <laughs> uh, will continue um, with uh, his lecture series on periods and zeta functions of Philippe. Uh, thank you, thank you. No, I almost ran off, but I didn't. Okay. So. The normal way to proceed is to explain things you understand to others, and we've got more or less to the end of that, so I will now try and explain things I don't understand, uh, in the hope that somebody can instruct me about this. So, this is on. Also, um, these lectures, the various lecture courses, although um, they're given, being given independently, in fact, mesh together um, extremely well. Uh, we're talking about a lot of the same things, um, or complementary things, and, and sometimes just in slightly different language. So. One of the topics that I touched on, well, the one of the topics that I, I, I was at pains to discuss yesterday was the business of the Kaler class. So I want to carry on discussing that today in, 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 in a, or talk around that. So. We're back to mirror symmetry, so for the quintic, so P4, 5, quintic in P4. Um, we have the Hodge numbers that you've seen before. Okay, so we have uh, the, 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 the Hodge numbers like that. And if we go to the mirror, then the mirror has 101 divisors. So this is something that, so the words I want to write down here are sort of Kader class. Okay. Now, um, this isn't a new uh, isn't, isn't, isn't a new topic, but I find when I talk to number theorists that, that you know, the Kaler class is something that's just passed them by. Um, and it shouldn't, right? Um, even algebraic geometers uh, tend not to think of it quite so much. The, because if you talk about something like P45, then what is the Kähler class? Well, the Kähler class is just the size of the P4, right? P4 has a size, just like 
a sphere has a size. And, and, but you don't care because that size scales out of the problem, really. On the other hand, you could have uh, a more complicated space. For example, you could have a hypersurface in a product of P2 cross P2, and then each P2 would have a size. And one could be twice as big as the other one, say. Okay, then the relative size, you would imagine, would have some, some, some effect. When we talk about the mirror of the quintic, then you take the, we construct the mirror by taking the manifold M, quotienting by this group, and then resolving. And in the process of doing that, there are fixed curves. There are curves that are fixed under the, um, by the group. And these curves even intersect. Oh, well, that's a bad drawing. But they intersect in such a way that three curves, when they intersect, three curves run through the same point. And when in this process of, of blowing up, you have to repair these singularities. You have to repair um, the singularities, uh, the, the curves which have become singular. And then there are additional singularities that need further resolution, which is where the curves cross in these, in these points that are really very singular. Um, and when you do that, you cut out the singular curves and points, and then you replace them by bits and pieces that are smooth. And these bits and pieces that you put in have a certain size. And those sizes are independent. You can choose the sizes of these various, various features independently. And this means that the Kähler class of, the, of W, so W, as H11 is H21 of M, which is 101. So by the time the dust settles on this process, you've increased the number of Kähler parameters to 101. And this is something that the zeta function doesn't take into account at all. Okay. So it could be that what you want to do I mean, an idea for what you want to do is that we said that, 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 that zeta w was this, I'm going to call it r naught today, this, this quartic factor. And it was this over 1 minus t, 1 minus pt, 1 minus pt to 101, 1 minus p squared t to 101, 1 minus p cubed t. And one thing you could think of doing is, well, it's, it, it's even a natural thing to do. You could take R0 and separate it out this way. This is the piece that arises from the four fundamental, from the fundamental system of four periods. And then there's this extra piece. that arises, if you like, from repairing the singularities. And one thing you could imagine doing is counting the points that appear on these divisors with different parameters. So you could weight them, you could introduce more t's. And instead of constructing a zeta function with one t, you could uh, construct a zeta function, say, with 100 t's, and weight the contributions of each divisor separately. I'm not entirely sure how to do that in detail, but it's something that one could think about. Um, there's something else that that, that that in itself won't fix, won't fix the, the form of the zeta function, but might well be a first step on the right road. Um, Well, the, what I mean by a Kähler class? If you have a, uh, a Kähler ma a manifold, then you have a 1-1 form, J, which was I, G mu, nu bar, 
dx mu dx mu bar it, it, and if there are h11 um, you could choose a basis in, in, in h11 which is the same thing as h2 right and, and uh, j would be a sum of ti ei where e, these e's are, are basis elements in h2 right and then the t's are parameters That's right. Right. Okay. So, as I said, one could consider weighting these um, weighting the points on the divisors uh, separately, and that's probably a good thing to do. There is another point that um, I want to make. And that is, in some ways, well, I want to discuss at length now, we discussed the fundamental period, uh, pi, lambda, epsilon, and we said that was the sum a n of epsilon, lambda to the n plus epsilon. And yesterday we regarded this epsilon as a purely formal device, for generating solutions of the differential equation, for generating the logarithmic solutions. And we said that, in fact, to generate the, there was a, a differential equation, L pi equals naught, with four solutions, pi naught, pi one, pi two, and pi three. And in order to find these, what we had to do was, in fact, calculate this Frobenius period and then use the result that epsilon to the fourth is zero, but epsilon cubed is not zero. Okay, so if we do that formally, then this generates this generates the series. Um, k is zero to three, one over k factorial pi k of lambda. Okay. Now this is very much like the Kähler class. In fact, because the manifold, let's call it H, this is very much like the K class, because the manifold is three-dimensional, we're supposed to use in cohomology the intersection rule that says that H to the fourth is zero. And there's more to this than just an analogy. So I want to actually bring this out today. And more to the point, we saw, well, also to the point, we saw when we computed the numbers of points that if we computed just the number of point n rather than, so we wrote expressions for nu, which remember was uh, related to n by n is nu minus 1 over p minus 1. We found it more convenient to write expressions for nu, which was the total number of solutions without trying to remove the origin or remove the scaling degree of freedom. However, if we said that we tried to calculate n instead, then we could calculate this in terms of the genuine periods. We could calculate this in terms of pi 0, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3. If we tried, uh, and it, it was enough to do that, and then use the relation, it was enough to work mod p to the fourth. So it was enough to set p to the fourth is 0. So now we have three things whose fourth power gets set to zero. Okay. And I believe it goes deeper than this. I mean, I believe that P is somehow related to the Kähler. Well, epsilon is definitely the Kähler form or the Kähler class, as I'll show in a minute. But um, somehow P is also related to the Kähler class. And I'm not sure how to develop this. Somehow you want to include, well, th this raises interesting questions, which is that in this, in this case, there's only one, H11 is one, and there's only one Kähler class parameter. But one can easily, the optic, which I'll talk about tomorrow, has 
H11 is 2 for the octet. And that leaves open that somehow you want to introduce more primes. Okay. And so it may be that what you want to do when you calculate the zeta function is not only count the numbers of points with separate parameters, but also count the number of points over each divisor with over, over a different field. Okay. So I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't thought this through in a consistent way. But it seems to me that, that something along these lines might be, might be what one has to do. That's the, 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 that, 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 that's the suggestion, yes. Well, we have, I'm going to talk now about the divisors of the mirror, so we'll have a bit more time to discuss that. But the idea is that you have various, when you blow up, you introduce certain divisors. And you may want to count those points. So say you introduce a P1, so it has P plus 1 points. You might want to count those points in the sum with a separate parameter. So introduce another T. Um, but you also might want to count that number of points over a different field, okay, with a different prime. So count them over the field with L elements instead of over the field with P elements, and, and perhaps include that. So I, I, I'm not entirely sure what it is I want to say, but that's okay. Um, but, but, but you can tell me what it is that I mean. Okay. So. Um, I want to discuss the divisors of, I, I, I want to discuss the mirror, okay, of, uh, of 4, of P4, 5. And a lot of this discussion takes place in, I mean, the language for this discussion is toric geometry, so this ties in very well with Victor's lectures. And since he's developing the subject properly, I can afford the luxury of just drawing some diagrams and saying this is how it goes. So that's what I want to do, a sort of hands-on approach to, 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 to this. So we start with the reflexive polyhedra. Okay. It, it came from solving... It came from solving the differential equation that you have a function, this, this Frobenius period, which is a power series in epsilon, and the, the first four terms give you genuine solutions to the differential equation, and then the higher terms give you something else. Okay, but they're not solutions anymore. Okay, so if you're interested in genuine solutions to the equation, you're supposed to set epsilon to the fourth equals zero, and then you truncate the series after four terms, and, and that's it. Okay. So we saw two things, actually, which was quite interesting. One was that if we were only interested in counting the number of points, it was enough to work mod p to the fourth, right? if you work with n. Right. So if you work them with the quantity that people traditionally calculate, it was enough to work mod p to the fourth. On the other hand, if you take that solution to a number theorist in Oxford, and you show it to him, he tells you it's very ugly. Right? And so to keep him happy, you can keep all these extra terms. You keep the terms to infinity. They don't actually change the answer. They just make it look nicer. They mean, right. Okay? So instead of working mod p to the fourth, you get an exact p-adic expression. So this is very like what you do in quantum cohomology. Right. Right, where you forget, so, you forget h to the fourth is zero, and you keep the higher powers of h. So it's very much like things one does. As I said, it makes no difference, at perfectly, at a purely pragmatic level, it makes no difference. You, you, you can calculate mod p to the fourth and get the exact answer, because you know it's an integer, or if you want to write it as a p-adic integer, a nice p-adic integer, which is also a rational integer, then you keep all the terms. Right. So, I mean, I suppose one way of testing this, this, this analogy is if you look at, what happens if you look at uh, periods of a higher dimension, right, coordinate, then... 
Well, there's a, the, the, yeah. there's plenty to test in three, in three, di three di in three dimensions before we go. Uh -huh. Sorry, uh, probably also in two. Sorry. Go, 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 go. Right. right. And so uh, it's a little bit unfair on the mirror to ask for 101 parameters to appear when the formula that you were that you're going to compare it against it only had one. You can get away with very little when Jacques is in the audience. Yes. No. What you say is completely true. Uh, I tried to make the presentation easy. There were really 101 parameters. I didn't presume to write down the zeta function with 101 parameters because it's too much. Right. But, okay. The zeta function for the quintic depends on the complex structure of the quintic. Right. Really, the complex structure of the quintic, although I keep on writing down a one parameter family of quintics, the most general quintic has 101 parameters. Right. I didn't, you know, I'm being castigated now because. I didn't write down the full 101 parameter uh, family for the thing. But now when I talk about the mirror, I keep on making the big point that there are 101 K classes. But that's because you're making this point that the data function should depend on the Right, yeah, right. Okay, so as long as we're clear, right? So I should have done a better job and I should have written down the 101. I, mean, Just, I, should, I, should, I, should, have done, I should have done all that, right? Right. But you wouldn't have been able to calculate the zeta uh, I wouldn't have been able to fit it on this sheet of paper. No, but okay. the, the no. whole point of your calculation is that you can no, that's, take that, that, all the cohomologies of small pieces. Right? No, no, that's right. That, that's, that, that's right. So, so, so it was an, right, it's a, a, a toy calculation, as we say, right? And, and then you say, who's interested in toy calculations? So, okay. Well, when you do the optic, at least you'll have two parameters. That's right. That's right, that's right. So we proceed by small steps. Okay, okay. As, but as long as we're clear what I should be doing and what I am doing, it's okay. Okay? Okay. So a little bit crash course on reflexive polyhedra, if that's okay. And there, so this is how it goes, and as I said, Victor does it all properly. So even go down a bit. So, so now start, start, just because we can draw the diagrams, take a cubic in P2. So this is an elliptic curve, right? So this is given, say, by I is, is 1 to 3, xi cubed minus 3 times a parameter, x1, x2, x3 is 0, okay? And so we look, the, we look at... The polyhedron of the monomials. So we have some monomials x to the m. m is m1, m2, m3. Each mi has to be positive, and m1 plus m2 plus m3 is 3. So that's what we mean by a cubic monomial. And you draw, you can't stop yourself drawing m1, m2. M3 space, and so where do these things lie? Well, these lie on a triangle. So there's a triangle like this, where this, for example, is the point 3, 0, 0. This could be the point 0, 3, 0. There are two intermediate points. This is 2, 1, 0. This is uh, 1, 2, 0 there. Similarly, there are two points there, two points there, and very important, one point in the middle. Okay, and that is, is one, one, one. Okay. So this way, you get two things. You get a polyhedron, delta, and you get a lattice, which is the set of monomials. Okay, so these aren't actually written down, but I could write them down if I deformed the equation. Okay. Now, although the figure is three-dimensional, really this is a two-dimensional 
It's a two-dimensional lattice and it's a two-dimensional polyhedron and it has precisely one interior point. And the fact that it has precisely one interior point is a consequence of C1 equals zero. It's a consequence of the fact that it's a calabi yau manifold. Okay. So we take the interior point as the origin of coordinates and we refer this polyhedron, say, to a, an intrinsic basis, say this vector and this vector, and we draw it again and it looks like this. So, okay, so here are our basis vectors, like this. So we have axes, psi, and eta. And we write down the equations of the faces. So this face is psi plus eta is 1. This face is eta is minus 1, so I write that as minus eta is 1. And this face I write as minus psi is 1. Okay. Now, because this is calabi yau this polyhedron is reflexive. And reflexive means a number of things. It means it has precisely one interior point, and it means that the equations of the faces can always be written this way with, with coefficients that are integers with no, common, um, with no common factor, and no, I don't. That's right. Integers with no common factor, and the right hand side is, can always be taken to be one. Okay. So those, those facts together make it uh, reflexive. And since the right-hand side is restricted to be 1 as part of the rule, then the equation for the face is in fact given by giving the coefficients of psi and eta. So this face we could think of as 1, 1 being the coefficients here. This face we could think of as being 0, minus 1. And this face we could think of as being minus 1, 0. And this being so, again, you can't stop yourself drawing, plotting those points. So psi plus eta is 1 is the point 1, 1, 1. Um, minus psi is 1 is the point minus 1, 0. And this one is the point 0, minus 1. And so in this way, we get another polyhedron with one interior point here and just three points this time. And if you do this again, you go back. So if you, if you work out the equations of this face, uh, of the three faces, you'll find that they correspond to the vertices over here. So in this way, we get a pair of reflexive polyhedra. So there's, na there's delta, which is this one, which is the Newton polyhedron. And there's nabla, which you recognize if you, you follow the toric geometry, you recognize nabla as the polyhedron made by taking the fan for CP2, which are these three arrows, and going out till you in intersect the first lattice vectors along the arrows and then connecting up. So this is the polyhedron over the fan of P2. So, in this way, given a manifold M, well, it corresponds to, given a manifold M, we have a Newton polyhedron delta and its dual polyhedron nabla. And nabla, so this, is, this gives us the monomials, tells us the degree of the equation, if you like, and this gives us the fan of the toric variety, I'll call it P nabla, the fan of the toric variety in which the hypersurface lives. Okay. So, now, the wonderful thing is that given the data here, you can go back. Given the, the nabla, you can construct the toric variety P nabla, and then you can construct the hypersurface in it. So, 
given the, the, the toric data, you can construct the, at least you can construct a family of manifolds. Okay, so the toric data, data constructs a family of, hypers of manifolds. that includes the one we're talking about. Okay. So, and of course, mirror symmetry in this language is now very easily expressed because given one of these polyhedra, you make the other one as the dual. So, we could have started with nabla and delta, and we could have from, uh, from this data, we would have constructed a manifold, and the manifold we would construct is the mirror of M. Okay. And so, one thing we see from this, of course, is that delta occurs here and here. And so, here, this is the space of monomials. Right, this is a set of monomials, x to the v or x to the m. I think we called it x to the m just now. So, points here, a point in here is, a, is two things. One, uh, one uh, level, it's a monomial occurring corresponding to m. But at the other level down here, it's a divisor. The points in the, uh, the, the these are points now or, or uh, rays in the fan points in nabla or rays in the fan of p, uh, p uh, of the toric variety, so these are also divisors of the toric variety in which W lives. Okay. And these divisors intersect in general W, and so they produce uh, divisors of W. So M here, M is a divisor of W. Let, let's try and be a little correct of the toric uh, variety in which W is a hypersurface. Okay. Okay. So now we can say how it is. the mirror of W. So, more or less. Okay, so, now the trouble is, I, I, I did this for the, um, I did this for the cubic, because there it was very nice that figures were two-dimensional and you could draw them. If you do it for the quintic, then uh, we're talking about threefold, and the rule is that the dimension of the polyhedron is one, the real dimension of the polyhedron is one greater than the complex dimension of the space. So that was the rule. So for a one-dimensional complex manifold, an elliptic curve produced a two-dimensional polyhedron. For the quintic, we produce a four-dimensional polyhedron, which given the fact that the board isn't very good, is hard to draw. Okay. Um, nevertheless, okay, it turns out that the point's interior, so it's a four-dimensional polyhedron, has three-dimensional faces. It's a simplex. The three faces are tetrahedra. Um, the point's interior to the tetrahedra don't count. Okay. These are divisors of the toric variety that don't intersect the hypersurface. Um, this being so, we can go down to the two faces, and this is a typical two-face. So this is, is it just one of the two faces that's being drawn. And so here, for example, this is the, the vertex. I don't know if you can see it. This is the term 5, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that's x1 to the fifth. This, this vertex down here is x2 to the fifth. This vertex here is x3 to the fifth. And here are these other points. Okay. That, that fit in. And the story behind this two-phase is that this tells us how to resolve the 
mirror manifold. So I said that when, the, 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 when you perform this quotienting, that there were some fixed curves, and these curves meet in threes. And you should think of each edge of this triangle as corresponding to one of the fixed curves. Okay. Then each edge has one, two, three, four points, four red points there, which correspond to various of these Vs that we've been discussing. Okay, so this is 4, 1, so going up this way, this is 0, 5, this is 1, 4, 2, 3, 3, 2, 4, 1, 5, 0 at the top. These four red points on this curve tell you that you have to blow up four times to fix the curve. Okay. So each of these curves gets blown up four times to fix the curve. But, and three curves meet in a point. That's the statement that the, the two-face has three edges. Then, but that's not enough. The, three, the, the blowing up fixes the curve, but it doesn't fix the point where the curves intersect. And the extra six points that lie in the interior, so these are these 3, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, um, and so on. These, these are another six blow-ups that are necessary to, uh, to resolve the intersection of the curve. So in this way, you get a nice description of the blow-ups that you have to do to, 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 uh, to resolve the uh, to, to, to resolve W. Okay. So one can follow this through in, in this paper in this reference too, then all this is done in, in the most in the most tedious detail and um, you can follow it through and actually see how you count the points in the, uh, in the mirror. There may well be a quicker way of doing it. Okay. So now I want to say come back to the, this diagram and these considerations are relevant also for the Frobenius period. So now there's there's a general construction, and this is part of the part of the story that that uh, Victor was telling you today. So one can construct the Frobenius period directly from considerations of toric geometry. So let's let's um, set up start off a, a little generally, so let M be a CY hypersurface in P, delta, in P nabla, so M corresponds to delta, and it's a surface in the, in the toric variety constructed from nabla, and there'll be an equation, so P of X will be Let me call it sigma m prime to establish some notation. So there'll be some coefficient cm x to the m. So again, x to the m denotes a monomial. m is a vector. cm x to the m minus c naught. And I think it'll be clearest if I call the fundamental monomial q. So q is, the, is, is x1 to x5, if you like, x1, x2, x3, x4. Um, and sum prime, this means, this means that this is a sum m in delta, but m, m not equal to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, because that one is included exp explicitly, explicitly here. And there's a convention that puts a minus sign in front of the coefficient of the fundamental monomial. Now, the following is a solution of the system of differential equations that, that uh, Victor is describing for you. Okay. 
So there's some notation, I'll write it down, and then we'll, we'll say what it means. So there's a, a, a product primed, which means precisely this, sum over m's, uh, product over m's in delta, but not over the fundamental monomial, gamma of dm plus 1 over gamma minus d0 plus 1, sum gamma in V Napla. I think so. Um, gamma of minus gamma dot D0 minus D0 plus 1 over product M primed uh, gamma function gamma dot DM plus DM plus 1, c to the gamma plus d. Okay, and I just have to explain what all this means. Okay, so, dm are the toric divisors of Nabla. Right. D zero is defined to be minus the sum M prime to DN, so it's defined to be minus the sum of the other divisors. The summer is over. Uh, the sum is over curves, gamma, in the Mori cone. of P Nabla. Okay. So, the divisors form a cone, which is the Kähler cone, and the dual to the uh, divisors are curves, and they form a cone, and that's the, the Mori cone of... Uh, so the cone dual to the Kähler cone is the cone of curves in which gamma lives, and that's the Mori cone of P nabla. Okay. And C... Are we still on the... Let's see if we can get the... the, 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 the create a little space here. Um, C gamma plus D is the product M in delta Cm to the gamma M or gamma M plus Dm. Okay, so we can think of, okay, so the Cm's are the coefficients here. The Gammas we can think of, so, so the D's form, the, the D's lie in a linear space. We can think of gamma as being a vector in the dual space. And so uh, gamma has the um, same number of components as there are monomials M. And so, uh, I'll give an illustration. This, this seems a bit abstract, but I'll give a, uh, an illustration of how this goes in just a moment. Okay. So this is a procedure given an equation in a toric variety of constructing a solution of the period of the GKZ system. And it's... A, this solution involves the divisors of the space. Okay. Now, the way the calculation goes is, so let's, to get a space with few divisors, we apply this to the mirror quintic. I could apply it to the quintic, but then there'd be more there'd be more discussion, and 
we know that the mirror quintic shares uh, four of the periods are the same for the mirror quintic as for the quintic. So uh, I'll just go off to those four periods now and make the discussion as simple as possible. So the mirror quintic has a polyhedron. So let's now we're going to turn things around. So our fundamental space is going to be the mirror quintic. Okay. The quintic was the big polyhedron, and that was the analog of the cubic in P2. The mirror polyhedron to the big one is a small polyhedron, which is analogous to the situation for the elliptic curve also. In the elliptic curve case, the mirror polyhedron, the mirror polyhedron was just this one. It just involved... The only points, it was a tetrahedron with just vertices and the interior point. So it is for the mirror quintic that the mirror, the, the mirror polyhedron is just a simplex, is a four-dimensional analog of a tetrahedron, and the only points are the vertices and the interior point. Okay. So we do we follow a procedure that's been advocated by Morrison and what we do now is we write down these divisors, so d naught, d1, d2, d3, d4, d5. Okay, so d1 through d5 are the dn's. Okay, they are the 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 the, the, the vertices of the vertices of, of the simplex. Um, we write down here 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that's right, and a 1 down here. And here we write down the monomials 5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 0. That. And the columns of this matrix give us relations between the <coughs> divisors. So, okay. So let's have a look. So we think of vectors d being d zero, d m, and similarly we append an extra component to gamma, gamma, gamma being one of the curves in the Morricone, and we d0 was defined to be minus the sum of the remaining ones, and gamma0 is defined to be minus the sum of the remaining ones. Okay. Like the sum, like that. Okay. Now, these relations, each of these columns gives us a linear relation between the divisors, and so the first relation says precisely that, that the sum of all of them, in other words, the sum of all of them vanishes, so this is simply the relation here, that d0 is minus the sum of dm. Then this column will give us the relation that says that d0 is minus 5d1, and the second one, second column gives us the relation that says that d0 is minus 5d2, and so on, and d0 is minus 5d5. So we discover that d1 is d2 equals, equals d5, and we call that h, and d0 is, is then minus 5h. So in fact, as we knew in, well, so, although we started with what looked like five divisors, there are linear relations, and the quantity, uh, the, the, the only important quantity is this quantity H at the end of the day. Okay. Now, then, come back to the polynomial. The polynomial was... We're, we're talking about the mirror quintic, so our, our polyhedron has only five points. 
So the most general polynomials of, the, of this form, C1x1 to the fifth plus C2x2 to the fifth plus 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 C5x5 to the fifth minus C0, X1, X2, X3, X4, X5. Um, I'm going to work over the... I, I'm not going to worry about which field I'm working on for the moment. I leave, you, I leave that for you to, to sort out nicely. I'm sure it can be done. Um, you start like this, and you redefine... You can redefine, or you scale coordinates, and so we write that Y... I is Xi over Ci to the one fifth, and in this way we get the equation that P is Y1 to the fifth plus Y2 to the fifth plus dot dot plus Y5 to the fifth minus 5 Psi Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, Y5, but 5 Psi is, having done the scaling, 5 psi is C0 over C1, C2, C3, C4, C5 to the 1 fifth, or, if you like, lambda is C1, C2, right, so lambda was our friend, 1 over 5 psi to the fifth, which is C1, C2, up to C5 over C0 to the fifth. Now, this is, this is very pretty because lambda was... I, I sort of introduced lambda at the beginning and said lambda is a good coordinate, and um, we didn't question that, and the reason that it was a good coordinate is the fundamental period had this form, n factorial to the fifth, lambda to the m, and if we chose lambda to be the fundamental... It's all the way around, right? Because xi is... Well, xi is one, that is one. Thank you. OK. We chose lambda in here to be... Uh, just because this was a natural choice of variable, and then if we did that, then these quantities are all integers. So since we're interested in the number theory, that seemed to be a good thing to do. But here, there's <clears throat> a better reason, which is that if we think of this as c to the k, where k is, is minus 5, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, like that, then this, in fact, is the generator of the Mori code. So the toric geometry picks out for you, it, it, along the way it tells you what the natural variables are, and so lambda comes out of this, lambda comes out of this as a natural procedure. And if we now just take this rather forbidding formula, and um, substitute in, well, the Kähler cone is one-dimensional in this example, and so the Mori cone will be one-dimensional, and it turns out that K was a generator, so the general curve in the Mori cone is N times K, and K is the generator, so K times H is 1, and so if we now uh, put all this into, into the uh, fundamental period, you find it just reduces to pi of lambda and h is... Uh, gamma must be to the fifth h plus 1 over gamma 5h plus 1 sum over n, because we're summing over gammas, gamma of gamma dot d0, gamma dot d0 is gamma dot minus 5 
H. Is that right? Can't be. No, it's right, it's minus gamma dot d0, right? It's minus gamma dot d0. Can you see that? Yeah. Minus gamma dot d0 is minus gamma uh, is 5n, right? So this is 5n from here plus 5h plus 1 over gamma to the fifth of n plus h plus 1 times lambda to the n plus h. So, this is precisely the Frobenius period with epsilon given in terms of the, of the hyperplane class, as they say, n is 0 to infinity. Okay, now I'm out of time. I was going to do the optic. If I'd done the optic, it would be even clearer because there there are two, uh, two generators rather than one. So the point is that this epsilon um, really is to be taken seriously as the Kähler, as the Kähler form or the hyperplane class of the manifold. Um, and someone should explain to me the correspondence between that and the prime, right? The fact that primes are divisors is one of the big ideas of algebraic number theory, and somebody here should be able to explain that to me. So thank you.